really tough one. I'm just glad that we get an Armageddon on this and we've got a Sicilian. I'm really glad about that as well. A two and a half minute, almost a two and a half minute deficit on the clock for uh, Maxime. There's no increment in the Armageddon. We see a Rossolimo, so a close setup in the Sicilian here. But Maxime goes with Queen takes Bishop. We've seen this opening before where the Bishop was recaptured by the Knight. A different approach. Magnus slows down and strikes in the center. Maxime keeping up the pace, David. Yeah, and uh, I think Maxime here, whether he's well prepared or not, um, he's of the opinion that he needs to just keep up the speed, play fast, very understandable. White uh, sets up this Maroxy bind pawn structure. We saw something very similar. You uh, alluded to that. Uh, also in a bishop b5 check Sicilian, that was between Ferruja and Duda. And uh, now the white knight is going to come to c3. A lot of central control for white. Magnus first uh, just kind of takes more control over his territory, stopping the black knight from using the g4 square. I've got to say, Magnus loves these types of positions. Um, whether he can uh, apply pressure, win this game is a whole different matter, but he's going to be happy with the outcome of this opening, still with an extra two and a half minutes on his clock. Bashir de Grave finally starting to think Tanya. Um, would you say he's as happy as Magnus? Black is solid, but not very active. I don't think he's thinking about that. In this Armageddon, he has to keep the pace up. The position is as is. I will say one thing, that that bishop in G7, the Fiancata bishop that Black has, is one of Maxime's favorite pieces. He is the OG Grunfeld player. And this last move, A6 controlling the B5 square, stopping any knight jumps, also hinting at a future B5 break himself. I think Maxime's at least happy to get that bishop on G7, which for the time being cannot be challenged and has an open diagonal in front of him. A small small something to play for as black yeah definitely long term if the bishop survives it will uh, often exert pressure and influence over this diagonal root to d1 hints that uh, pawn to e5 might be a threat in the near future the black queen was a target sitting on the d file so she shifts she moves uh, this reminds me of Garry Kasparov against the world when uh, a black queen landed on e6 a black knight came in and kind of forked that queen and uh, okay long uh, long, long ago, that very niche reference in the early 2000s, but uh, a very similar idea from the same opening, actually. Queen to e6, a uh, bit of a clumsy square, but uh, applying some pressure. Uh, c4 a bit weak, e4 a bit weak. Magnus, the one problem I would say, Tanya, is that b3 never possible due to this uh, bishop you mentioned, this sniper um, hitting the rook in the corner. b3 would open up all sorts of knight takes pawn <laughs> possibilities um, with a loose rook. So uh, not totally easy for Magnus to coordinate his pieces at the moment. Well, if you don't have b3 and bishop b2, the other thematic idea is put that knight on d5. You want to try to trade that knight, and then you can decide if you want to change the pawn structure, which very often is the choice of players, or it really depends stylistically. You want to trade more pieces. Knight d5 would be, the, would be another move that I would consider as white here. But again, Magnus has to win on demand this game. So knight d5 provoking some exchanges currently not possible. Knight takes d5, pawn takes knight would be a fork. He's thinking, what are the other alternatives? Because for me, again, knight d5 feels like the most natural move here. Yeah, now you've said it, Tanya. Um, I was just too lazy to calculate what happens if uh, a pawn falls on e4, but then the knight does jump into c7 uh, with uh, a material gain. So um, yeah, for those who know, they know. And uh, Magnus spots these patterns. He knows in that uh, Kasparov against the world clash, knight d5 was a typical idea. So I agree jump in, threaten that knight fork. I guess the black rook will react uh, by moving out of that idea. But, uh, maybe Magnus is looking into the future there. I just don't see any alternatives. That's the issue. And I'm worried about the clock, Tanya. The time advantage has pretty much slipped away now and playing on a Stop. touch screen with no increment. What's, what's going to happen if it gets down to a time scramble? I don't think Magnus can keep up. The clock advantage is dwindled. So basically, Maxime has got the result odds for him right now. And Magnus also looks like he's not happy about the fact that he has to spend so much time. The other tactic I want to point out is, as you said, knight takes pawn after knight d5 would run into knight c7. You can't even capture the pawn with your queen. Queen takes pawn and the intermezzos that we've been seeing all throughout the day. Knight takes f6, you'd remove the defender and then end up winning the queen. But Magnus is thinking. He's definitely spotted knight d5, but there's something else that's on his radar. And I'm just wondering what that could be. Does he want to just take out his bishop? Yeah, moving the bishop to e3 or f4 was very natural as well. This is uh, maybe the safer of the options. Um, very good move, but not necessary to burn, what was it, two and a bit minutes on that one decision. 
um, Armageddon is the most difficult thing in chess. That's why we love it as a uh, decider in these types of high profile clashes. But yeah, using two and a bit minutes there could come back to haunt Magnus, especially knowing that he is on that touch screen right now. So bishop b3, if white gets one more move, rook c1 or b3, then I think he's going to have a bind forever. But look at that, Magnus on the camera, Tanya, shaking his head, reacting to something. Yeah, it's the kind of reaction where he suddenly realizes that he he didn't see something. And I'm not sure what that was. Maybe we'll get a chance to ask. He seems not happy with his decisions, uh, David. Was it this move he's missed? Knight to b4, Magnus. His queen is attacked, and the queen cannot defend both the c4 pawn and the e4 pawn. So you have to choose. And here, the blue arrow appears, making our job easier. Magnus hasn't seen this. Queen b1, Tanya, I'm going to say it's a really difficult move. Not obvious, because it looks like you're going in the wrong direction, blocking in your rook in the corner. But uh, if the queen were to slide back to b1, let's quickly show this. Queen takes c4 now would not work in black's favor. Rook to d4 is a skewer. The black queen can step back. Maybe this is where Magnus is uh, unsure. And uh, actually, I don't immediately see the follow-up for white. Black is a pawn to the good. This is what the players are calculating right now. What is the follow-up? It looks precarious with the queen on c5, but maybe black's surviving. It really does look like you're hanging by a thread here. You know, you could also throw in a move like a3 and force that knight to c6, maybe taking away some key running away squares for the queen, trying to trap it. I'm glad to see the eval bar doesn't drop after that. And David, I think you're showing us the way. Wow. Yeah, a3 wasn't actually immediately obvious to me because I was trying to catch that knight. Uh, but here the queen is trapped, double attack. If she steps forward again, Whoops, she's caught. No way home, no escape square. So Magnus has found queen to b1, the best move, the only move to keep the game going uh, with an advantage. Now, queen takes c4 looks like a poisoned pawn, Tanya. But you have to calculate this line through, right? Because it's also very tempting to take this pawn. And Maxime, is he going to risk it? Because Ooh. the whole sequence of moves, not the easiest calculation, David. He doesn't, he avoids it. He avoids any uh, big mine holes there. Rook c8, doubles down on the c4 pawn. Now Magnus defends it. Both players around the five minute mark, no increment, and the game is just starting to heat up. Yeah, ultimately it looks like the Black Knight will force, be forced to retreat. The White Queen will come back where she came from. And we're back to square one. I mean, uh, we're literally in the early middle game and it's just a pure blitz time scramble now. 10 second difference between the two players, Tanya. It's uh, the fastest hand is going to win, essentially. This one is going to come down to flagging, uh, it feels like. And Magnus, slight shake of the head there. B5 played. Vashila Legrave really trying to fight fire with fire, allowing knight to d4, hitting the black queen. But she will step back, and it's all due to this loose white knight on the c-file. Looks like, uh, I've got to say, black has emerged in decent shape here. But there are so many tactics going on, and you can take on d4, Bishop will take on d4. The knight on c3 is protected. e5 runs into bishop takes pawn because notice how the d6 pawn was pinned. So instead, Maxime captures on b5. The queen has defended the b5 pawn. The rook on a8 hasn't made a single move, but it's already developed. It's on the ideal square. I like this position for black. Uh, it just feels that the a3, b3, a little bit of a loose queen side for Magnus. He's trying to target the b5 pawn, but the e4 pawn is tender as well. Yeah, the e4 pawn always weak. Maxime defends the weakness of his own on b5. And uh, Magnus only has one plan pretty much in these types of positions. Later, he will have to push his a pawn and hope he can just shovel it up the board as far as possible. But that pass pawn might just be a weakness that falls off the board. Uh, right now, Maxime, his task is clear. He's got four minutes. He's got a very pleasant position. I would say at least equal right now. Um, but is it enough time on the clock? Um, it's clarified somewhat, Tanya. It's a bit more open the position than it earlier was. That should favor the defender, should favor the one with draw odds, Maxi Vashel de Grave. David, I have a feeling that this game is going to come down to flagging. It's going to be a bit of a bullet fight between uh, these two players. It feels so incredibly balanced right now, but balanced in a way that it's not that all the pieces are traded off and it's a simple end game to play. There's still a lot of pieces on the board, different weaknesses to play for. The e4 pawn tender, the b5 pawn tender, the queen side pawns for Magnus, a3, b3 can become a target. The queen from b7 not only defends b5, but targets that e4 pawn that we that you've so kindly highlighted right now. Uh, David, there are ideas of black rerouting that knight from f6 to d7 at the right moment, getting retreating to only go forward on the next move. 
Magnus has got the D5 square. It's going to be a fist fight on the board and on the clock. Yeah, I was going to say a big threat as well. Black was threatening to push the pawn forward to B4 and just totally eradicate the white queen side. So now he's at least fixed one weakness, Magnus. At least this B5 pawn is not running anywhere anytime soon. It's going to tie down the black pieces for the rest of the game. And okay, Vasha Le Grave. A bit of a quirky move there, I'll say. Bishop to h6, he's trying to step out of uh, this diagonal in order to, to attack the white rook there, and the white rook needs to move. Rook c2, rook a1, rook b1, where do you choose? Magnus needs to speed up. Three and a half minutes each, almost, here. Uh, yeah, I think flagging, it's uh, the F word there. Flagging is going to be key uh, in this encounter. Magnus taking his time, and now the clocks are absolutely level. But Maxime has the result on. Ma it, it's on Magnus. He has to find a way to create complications to win this game. We say flagging, but Maxime Vacher Le Grave cannot be underestimated with his own mouse skills and his own bullet skills. One of the mm -hmm. favorites in the Speed Chess Championship, in the Bullet Chess Championship. He's equal to Magnus when it comes to flagging skills, David. It's not going to be easy. One pair of one set of pieces gets traded off. D6 pawn. Yeah. That's the soft spot. This is the soft spot, the big target right now. However, the e4 pawn also a bit vulnerable. So rook c4, watch out for that one later. Um, Black now trying to trade queens. Both sides uh, have weaknesses of their own. Magnus's weaknesses are harder to get at, maybe. But uh, if the queens are removed, then white's kind of glue starts uh, to crumble here. The white knight is very loose right now. I think Vashi Le Grave is on course to hold this game and the clocks have turned, Tanya. I just don't think Magnus has the speed to compete uh, with this touch screen right now. Um, that being said, rook to uh, d1 incoming. Um, he's trying to stare down at these targets, but will he be successful? It's a uh, far cry to uh, imagine right now uh, Magnus crashing through, but we said that the last game. David, the touch screen gives a huge handicap to Magnus in these kind of bullet brawl situations where speed really is the only thing that matters. And he's trying to play fast, though. He's right now ahead a few seconds, also trying to create some chaos on the board. The G-pawn, H-pawn up the board. G5 to try to get that D5 square for his own knight to jump to. It's asking questions, not the easiest ones to answer. G5, knight D5. And you start feeling the pressure is black. You do start feeling the pressure, definitely. G4, H4 was not on my radar. Uh, it looks like it just weakens the white king, but he's going for the black king potentially. And uh, Magnus, he's, uh, okay, he shifts his king up. He's undecided yet which pawn he'll push. At the right moment, he'll try and get that uh, D5 square for his uh, pony there. But, oof, yeah, 30 seconds on top suddenly, Magnus Carlsen. It's as if Vashi Le Grave didn't get the memo that flagging is uh, going to be key here. It's literally a bullet match at this point, Tanya. Roughly level position, although uh, maybe easier to play with white with all the threats. Um, but the clock is by far the most important factor right now. And Maxime, really nice maneuver there. He retreats the queen and then reroutes the rook to the open A line to target that A3 weakness. Magnus going for the plan. Knight D5 needs to come in because knight F4 is a threat. Yeah, that key square is covered, but suddenly the black pieces are piling up pressure on this loose weakness. And uh, the white knight is pretty much fixed where it stands for the rest of the game, Tanya. Maybe Magnus letting that one slip slightly because the knight on h5, uh, just its kind of influence over the f4 square, really annoying for white. Maybe Magnus rushed slightly and he's stuck. He just has to kind of play a waiting move. It's not necessarily improving his position. Um, what do you make of the chances here? Who do you think is the favorite? It's really hard to say. I'm just thinking about Magnus's touchscreen situation, and I do feel that if it comes down to those seconds, Maxime will be a favorite to flag Magnus. And there's no shame in flagging in this. This is the Armageddon. Flagging is not only allowed, it's highly encouraged in this format of tiebreak. And the position that we have, it remains rich, it remains full of tricks. That knight on h5 doing not only a key role of eyeing the f4 square, but also some great defensive task, not allowing the white queen to the f6 square as well. The rook has entered onto c1. Magnus now trying to change the dynamics, going into an endgame. 
Okay, Endgames have been his friend, Magnus Carlsen, so far. And uh, more importantly, look at this. He covers the F4 square, so he's freed up the White Knight to jump away. Um, so this is uh, uh, this is ugly, I agree. For everyone at home, do not double your pawns like this uh, unless you have a clear motif in mind. But um, right now, it's all about keeping that Black Knight sidelined. And, oh, doubled rooks, Tanya. Uh, Maxim's coming in. He's coming in. The b5 pawn is a soft spot for Maxime, and that knight on d5 is dangerously close to it. So you always have to watch out for maneuvers like knight c3 picking that up. Right now, the a3 pawn is hanging, so knight c3 would be met by rook takes pawn. Not a possibility on the board. Maxime's rooks definitely more active. Magnus's knight more active. Which one will be more yeah. powerful? Oh, it's hard to tell. I think I would prefer the rooks right now. Oh, look at these rooks. Oh, wow. Rookie one? Rook... Can you go rookie one? You can. That was a blue arrow. Checkmate is threatened in one move. Magnus living life on the edge. His king is trapped. G... Rook g2 runs into rook into pawn ideas. David, how do you even defend it? You have to come back with your knight to e2, but g5 is hanging. Oh, but now rook takes e3 is going to happen, and it's a to skewer. A win now for Vesha Grub is inevitable. Magnus, that collapsed just at the wrong moment. It was the clock, Tanya. It was the touch screen. It was everything. But Vasha de Graaf, we have to give him credit. He controlled that game and he struck at uh, the right moment there. Just felt like he was in control, the Frenchman. What an absolutely crazy match.